Thanks, Lorraine, and uh, thank you for Low Card Down Under for allowing me to come and speak to all of you today. So I'm Dr. Alex Petrashevsky, and today I'm going to be talking to you about bone health through the lens of low carbohydrate medicine and nutrition. Um, so just a quick disclaimer before we go on, that none of this talk today constitutes any individual medical advice. So I'm mainly going to be talking about osteoporosis today. Osteoporosis is literally porous bones, and it's a condition of weak and fragile bones uh, with a characteristic low bone density, which confers a higher risk of the bones fra fracturing in the long term. And it's becoming increasingly common in the Western world. It's often undertreated and unrecognized because in part it's typically a clinically silent disease unless it manifests in, in, a, in a fracture. However, in the clinic, if I'm looking at patients, one clue I would look for is if a patient's height is continuously going down over the years, especially if they've got this characteristic stooped posture, then that's a bit of a giveaway. Uh, of all the complications of osteoporosis, hip fracture is generally the most feared one because not only do you get the pain, the hospital stay, and the, the potential surgery with it, but it carries a, a fairly significant associated mortality risk as well. Some common risk factors for osteoporosis include advancing age, being female, and if you are female, early menopause. Gut malabsorption states all increase the risk of osteoporosis, so that includes things like inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, and, and also post bariatric surgery. So we see a lot of those patients in our clinic as well. Autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and hypothyroidism increase your risk, uh, as do certain commonly used medications, including corticosteroids uh, and proton pump inhibitors, which we will commonly use for patients with reflux or stomach issues, uh, as well as anti-epileptic medications, which are used for patients with seizure disorders. And certainly in our clinic, we see a lot of all of these things um, on a daily basis, really. And it's very relevant because at its core, osteoporosis is a metabolic disease, uh, much like all the other metabolic diseases we treat. Now, most people look at bones and think that they're pretty static organs, but actually the truth is they're very metabolically active, uh, not too unlike fat cells, for instance. So our bones are constantly being broken down and remade, primarily through the work of two types of cells. So osteoclasts help us break down old bone and create space for osteoblasts to, to lay down some new, fresh, healthy bone. And this process continues indefinitely. This remodeling process helps our bones adjust uh, their structure to meet our changing needs. So think about weight loss or weight gain or growth spurts during adolescence as common examples. It also helps us repair small amounts of damage in the bone matrix and prevents accumulation of old, poor quality bone, uh, along with uh, maintaining very tight levels of calcium in the blood. So in an ideal state, this balance of breaking down old bone and making new bone should be fairly balanced. But if we end up in a state where we're breaking down more bone than we are laying, we can run into problems with low bone density. In our clinical practice, the most common way to measure bone density is with a DEXA scan, which stands for dual energy X-ray absorbitometry, uh, which is basically two low dose X-ray beams passed over the body. Uh, and the X-ray dose is much le less than a standard X-ray. And so with this, we can assess someone's lean mass and their sc skeletal density, uh, along with being able to measure their body fat percentage very accurately. So we'll often do it for patients for that reason alone in our clinic. Now this bone density can be expressed in absolute terms, so grams per centimeter squared, or as a T-score, which is more common. The T-score represents the, a number that compares the condition of your bone density to that of an average young healthy person with healthy bones. So a T-score of minus 1.0 uh, will mean that your bones are one standard deviation away from uh, a young healthy person. And if your T-score goes under minus 2.5, then that's indicative of osteoporosis. So this is an example of one of our recent patients who saw us in the clinic, a 54-year-old postmenopausal woman who got her first bone density with us. And you'll note here her T-score in her left hip is minus 2.8. So that's diagnostic of osteoporosis. Now the standard teaching is you reach your peak bone mass at about 30 to 35, and typically from that point onwards, it's all downhill. And so you can see that on this picture here, the medium bone density starts to fall at a certain point. Now there are some exceptions to that, but what this implies is um, your peak bone density is going to determine in part, at least, how careful you need to be about bone density later in life. In other words, if your peak was not that great, then you may have less bone density to play with than someone who's got a higher peak. And so you might need to be a little bit more careful about your strategy around preserving bone density. <laughs> 
Now, if you want to build bone, you need to know what's in it. So bone is made up of a bunch of different compounds. The primary component of bone matrix is something called hydroxyapatite. So that's basically calcium and phosphorus. There are other minerals in the matrix, including uh, magnesium, potassium, sodium, copper, and fluoride. But one thing a lot of people don't realize is our bones are made up of about 40 to 50% protein in the form of type one collagen. So all these minerals are really encased around this scaffold of protein and that's gonna be relevant later on. So let's say you've been diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis and we want to prevent a fracture later in life. The first thing everyone gets told to do is go and get some calcium. And while calcium does make up a major portion of our bone tissue, High dietary calcium intake doesn't seem to be that protective against osteoporosis related fractures. Uh, and you can see here the recommended daily intakes for men and women on the slide. Further to that, calcium supplements alone were not that useful in clinical trials. In fact, if we give people high dose calcium, it can actually pose some dangers because it can potentially increase your risk of, calcium, of uh, kidney stones. Uh, and potentially increase your risk of coronary calcification in the arteries. Because if, we're, if you're eating a, a sort of large dose of calcium and it doesn't go into your bones, it has to go somewhere else and it can end up in the, in the blood vessel wall. The second thing everyone gets told to do is get some vitamin D and that's potentially reasonable. So vitamin D is integral to bone health as it helps us increase our absorption of calcium in the gut. It reduces the loss of calcium from the kidneys, and it also helps regulate bone breakdown via the osteoclast. So it's working on both sides of the equation. And certainly in epidemiological studies, vitamin D deficiency is associated with increased risk of fracture and osteoporosis. But similarly, if we look at trials of just using vitamin D alone, they're a bit disappointing. So either the effects are small or they're non-significant. And in fact, intermittent uh, high dose vitamin D, which was quite fashionable for a while, is actually associated with an increased risk of fracture. So similar to calcium, if we just use vitamin D alone, it's not that useful. So what if we do something really clever and combine calcium and vitamin D together? Well, then things look a little bit better. So based on meta-analysis, if we combine these two supplements, you get some increases in bone density and you get some um, modest uh, reductions in the risk of fracture. So 15% uh, re relative risk reduction of total fracture and a 30% relative risk reduction in hip fracture. So that's, that's really the end point we're after. And if we look at just postmenopausal women, which are probably the highest risk group, this modest um, effect is still preserved. So that's nice. So now let's look at some less common interventions. Vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin important for the function of numerous proteins within the body, including clotting factors, uh, matrix GLA protein, which is important for uh, preventing uh, coronary calcification, and osteocalcium, which is an important uh, bone forming protein. Vitamin K exists in uh, several natural forms. So it exists as vitamin K1, which is the plant form, and you typically find this in green leafy vegetables. That's more relevant for clotting factors, whereas vitamin K2 is more relevant for the bone. And there's several subtypes, but the most important two are MK4, which we find in animal foods, such as eggs, meat, liver, that sort of thing. And MK7, which is found in higher quantities in fermented foods. So things like dairy and natto, which is a fermented soybean product. Now it's worth noting that K2 is a relatively new kid on the block. We don't have decades and decades and decades of study on it, but for what it's worth, we've got some RDIs of 120 micrograms a day for men and 90 micrograms a day for females. And it's also worth noting that the modern Western diet's probably deficient in vitamin K2. And actually like vitamin D, it's a fat soluble vitamin. So if we're restricting our fat content dramatically, then we're gonna find it a bit harder to get this in the diet as well. Now, about 15 years ago, there was a period of intense interest in using high dose pharmaceutical grade vitamin K2 as a supplement, either alone or with vitamin D as a bone protection agent. And these studies usually measured bone density or markers of bone turnover to see uh, what their results were. And they were a bit conflicting. So overall, combining K2 and vitamin D was a little bit more effective than using K2 alone, which only had a modest effect. If we look at some more standard dose vitamin K2 trials, so at doses that we could access in a pharmacy or a supplement store, um, the results again are a little bit conflicting, but this meta-analysis that came out last year suggested that K2 improved bone density uh, without necessarily having a clear improvement in fracture risk. There were improvement in bone health markers and the effect sizes were more pronounced in people with the worst osteoporosis. So if you were older or more frail or had 
worse bones, you are probably more likely to benefit than someone that had just some mild osteopenia, which is a milder version of osteoporosis. There are also some regional differences, which is quite odd. So the Japanese trials always seem to look a little bit better. And then when the Europeans tried to emulate that data, the, the results weren't quite as good. So that does raise the possibility that maybe there's a genetic difference in Japanese people that means they benefit for more, or maybe their, uh, their regional diets just happen to be a bit more deficient. But to sum up K2, it's safe, it's cheap, it's potentially effective, and it's particularly useful for high, dose, uh, for high risk osteoporosis and postmenopausal women. It also carries some non-bone benefits, especially for heart disease, so a lot of our patients will end up on it for that reason. Uh, our practice is generally to increase K2 in foods as a priority, but combining it with vitamin D and or calcium for higher risk patients is not unreasonable. Potassium is another bone constituent that often gets neglected, and higher potassium intake is associated with lower osteoporosis risk. In fact, there's a couple of recent studies done where they took a bunch of people and just gave them 50 grams of prunes a day, and that actually improved their bone density quite significantly, which was primarily put down to the potassium content of the prunes. Now, obviously the prunes have some carbohydrate in them, so they're not gonna be appropriate for everyone, but there are some people who'll be able to tolerate that carbohydrate content. Failing that, getting more potassium in our foods or in salts or electrolyte solutions is a common practice for our patients as well. Somewhat linked to potassium is magnesium, which not only supports potassium, but also calcium metabolism. Magnesium also independently supports osteoblast function, so helps them lay down new bone. And observational studies link higher magnesium intake with higher hip bone density. In fact, the magnesium content of our drinking water actually correlates very well with fracture risk and the magnesium content of our water varies quite a bit across the country, unfortunately. There aren't enough good long-term studies on magnesium supplements, but short-term studies show that uh, you actually get improve your hip um, bone density with just a simple magnesium supplement. So that's quite useful. And similar to K2, it's worth noting that dietary magnesium deficiency is very common. Our soil is becoming quite deficient in magnesium, so a lot of our patients do feel better when they take a magnesium supplement. So perhaps rather than looking at all of these ingredients in isolation, we need to be thinking about a more unified strategy if we want to um, maximise our bone building potential. And so several times through that data, you'll see that when we use something in isolation, it doesn't seem to be that good, but maybe if we combine them together, um, that's when we can build bone more, more effectively. And that kind of makes sense because to build bone, you probably need appropriate building blocks of all of these things. But what about protein? As I mentioned before, the, the bone collagen scaffold makes up a significant portion of our, uh, of our bone weight. And in fact, protein intake actually also modulates calcium absorption in the gut, which is incredibly helpful. And low protein diets are associated with higher bone breakdown and increased risk of not just osteoporosis, but fracture in the long term. And if we just look at studies of a classic low protein diet, which would be the vegan or plant-based diet, we can see just how bad it can get if we neglect dietary protein. So there's several systematic reviews showing that avoiding animal products significantly increases your risk of osteoporosis and fracture risk in the long term. Even if we ignore the source of the protein, be it animal or vegetable, higher protein diets are associated with lower hip fracture risk with the optimal protein intake being more in the vicinity of 1.2 grams per kilogram per day. And this really suggests that the current recommended protein intake of 0.8 milligrams per kilogram per day is grossly inadequate, especially for, for older patients who already have higher protein needs. Now, it's one thing to look at observational studies, but what about an actual interventional study? Well, this NEAT study came out in 2002 and attempted to address a few of these questions at once. So they took 342 uh, healthy patients above 65, so a classic at-risk group for osteoporosis and fracture. And over three years, they randomised them to either a control trial or an intervention with calcium and vitamin D. And through the period of the study, they did six monthly bone density scans and also attempted to regularly um, quantify their protein intake with food frequency questionnaires. So after that was all done, the patients were split into three groups based on their protein intake. So the lowest protein intake group averaged about 69 grams a day and the highest protein intake group uh, averaged about 87 grams per day. And what they found was the calcium vitamin D group in black had a modest overall benefit in um, bone density markers over placebo, which fits with the other data that we've looked at already. But what's more interesting is 
Once you did that, if you then also ate higher protein, um, you did better on all fronts. And particularly when they looked at femoral density, which is the best predictor of hip fracture, um, the effect was really quite pronounced. So this suggests that if you can get the mineral and micronutrient environment right, increasing your protein really takes your ability to build new bone to the next level. Now, I mentioned inflammation earlier in the talk, and the reality is that chronic inflammation has a major impact on osteoporosis and osteopenia, as it does for pretty much all metabolic diseases. In fact, we see early or severe osteoporosis as a complication of several chronic inflammatory disorders, such as inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, even, even chronic periodontitis is associated with worsening bone health. And in fact, there's many different pathways in the inflammatory cascade that can actually affect our osteoclasts and osteoblasts and how they function. And it's interesting that low carb and ketogenic diets have been shown to affect several of these. So the anti-inflammatory effects of your diet can have many benefits for your bone health as well. So now let's talk about some things you may want to avoid to optimize your bone health. First of these are lectins. So lectins are carbohydrate binding proteins commonly found in wheat, legumes, nightshade vegetables, among other things. They bind calcium in the gut, uh, which makes it harder for us to get it where we need to. And they can also cause chronic gut inflammation or leaky gut in some people, which can lead to malabsorption on its own. The second group of foods we might need to be careful with are phytates. So they also bind to calcium and, and can also bind to other trace minerals. And you'll find these in rice, soy, nuts, and certain legumes. And the third group of anti-nutrients I'll touch on are oxalates, which are found in spinach, nuts, seeds, again, legumes, bit of a recurring thing. Uh, and these tend to bind to calcium in the gut as well. Now, normally we're happy for them to bind calcium because it stops the oxalate crystals getting into our blood where they can cause uh, problems with kidney stones or joint um, issues. But if we're trying to prioritize our bone building uh, ability, then having them bind the calcium is not such a great thing. Now, just a quick note on everyone else's favorite vices. So unfortunately, tobacco, alcohol, soft drinks, and this is where I'm gonna get booed, caffeine, all have a negative effect on bone metabolism. Yeah, I know. Um, and they can increase your risk of osteoporosis in um, epidemiological studies. So we just need to be a bit wary about these if we're struggling with poor bone health. So what is an optimal or ideal diet for bone health? Well, it's unlikely that we're going to have a one size fits all approach and everyone's a bit different. But if I'm looking at some things I want to see in a diet from a bone perspective, it would be a diet that's protein forward, that's nutrient dense, that's ideally anti-inflammatory and ideally limiting anti-nutrients. So let's have a look. The, the standard Western diet or the food pyramid diet, maybe charitably we'd say it's protein neutral, but it's certainly not nutrient dense, it's not anti-inflammatory, it's not limiting anti-nutrients. So not much to recommend there. If we look at a plant-based or a vegan diet, similarly, it's not gonna be protein forward. Charitably, maybe it's nutrient, uh, nutrient uh, neutral, um, but again, probably not anti-inflammatory and certainly not limiting anti-nutrients. So not ticking many boxes. If we look at a well-formulated low-carb or ketogenic diet, however, we can see something that might actually fit the bill for what we need. And hot off the press this year, this systematic review uh, collated all the available randomized control trial data on available on low-carb diets and bone density. And these studies were done on adults rather than children, uh, which is gonna be important in a moment. Uh, and there were no appreciable differences in bone mineral density or bone turnover markets. So, Yes, it's only seven studies, it's not 50 studies yet, but it's a pretty good start and there's no signal in the data to suggest that the carbohydrate content of your diet is going to have a major detrimental effect on whether you lose bone mass or not. So if that's the case, why do we see headlines like this warning us that our bones are going to crumble away if we give up the carbs? A Couple of reasons. The first is there is actually some data on ketogenic diets in children for epilepsy that has shown that on average, kids that are put through this diet, their, their bone density is a little bit lower and their growth parameters are a little bit worse. Now, really important to note here that these kids have a very specific problem that requires a very strict diet, which is often quite protein restricted. So we can't really describe the diet they're getting as a protein forward diet. So the protein deficiency by itself could potentially explain why they are potentially not having great bone health. And the other thing is anticonvulsants, as I touched on earlier, they have a negative effect on bone metabolism. And these kids with epilepsy are frequently on these drugs as well. The second reason is this notion that we should be on an alkaline diet because that will be better for our bone health. Now, we know that bone actually helps buffer dietary acid load, although the exact magnitude of this effect is a little bit unclear. Uh, 
In petri dishes, osteoclasts tend to break down more bone in an acidic environment, and osteoblasts lay down less bone uh, in an acidic environment. Um, however, it's worth noting that when we eat more protein, our, our urine does contain more calcium, but it also um, probably contains more calcium because we're absorbing more in the gut. Um, and if you look at acidic foods, they tend to be things like meat, eggs, dairy, rice, and alcohol, and alkaline foods tend to be most fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes. And it's also worth noting that most of us are fortunate enough to have, to have kidneys that work well, and our kidneys um, do most of the work when it comes to buffering our blood pH. So um, as long as our kidneys are functioning, we shouldn't run into too many problems with dietary acid load. And if we look at a systematic review of all, this, all the data on alkaline diets for bone health, that's what we see. We see no clear relationship between dietary acid load and fracture risk or bone density as long as we've got functioning kidneys. So an alkaline diet's just a waste of time. Another point of contention came a few years ago in the form of the supernova study. So this was a study done on 30 world-class race walkers who were brought into study over a period of several weeks. And during this study, they were split into a standard high, high carbohydrate diet, which is more the standard athletic diet, I guess, and a low carb intervention group with equivalent calories. So at the start and at the end of the three and a half week period, they measured markers of bone resorption, formation, and overall bone metabolism. So we can see the protein intake was relatively matched between the two groups, although maybe a little bit more protein for the high carb group, but the major difference was the carbohydrate and the fat content of the two diets. At the end of the study, the low carb group showed fairly significant rises in CTX, along with reductions in P1, NP and osteocalcin. And all this combined suggests a shift in the low carb group to less bone formation and more bone breakdown. So the study authors concluded that a low carb diet is potentially dangerous for bone health in the long term. Now, before I touched on the importance of certain minerals when it comes to building bone matrix, and you can see here that some of these are listed here. And if you look through the appendix of the study to see the nutritional breakdown of both diets, you'll see that the low carb group had lower quantities of all of these minerals. So these two groups were unfortunately not adequately matched when it comes to these. So this could potentially explain some of the, the markers looking worse. But that's not where the issues ended. So this study was only done for three and a half weeks. So that's far too short to determine long term exercise capacity. The athletes were not fat adapted going into it, and many people in this room can attest to the fact that it takes a bit longer for your um, body to adapt to, to running on fat if you're an athlete. And also many people in the room, room can attest to what can happen uh, when it comes to keto flu if you don't get your electrolytes right uh, in the first week or so of the diet. The athletes were not explicitly advised to increase their sodium intake, which can help mitigate some of these effects of the keto flu. Um, and above all else, the study didn't actually produce any hard outcomes. So nobody got a fracture, nobody got their bone density measured. Um, and obviously there's a good reason for that because it's already hard enough to get so many world-class athletes together in one place. But I think it just needs to be something we're mindful of that this data is not necessarily something we can just transfer to the average person and tell them that they're gonna have long-term uh, impact on their bones. So putting it all together in the clinic, this is our framework to proactively manage bone health in our patients. We will suggest a baseline bone density in patients at risk or when they turn 50. Nutritional assessments done on all of our patients with a particular focus to protein intake, micronutrients, fatty acids, and very diligent attention to their electrolytes. We'll use supplements if appropriate, so calcium, vitamin K2, D3, and a protein supplement if it's needed, although we'd rather patients eat their protein. Any abnormal inflammation or malabsorption markers need to be addressed and followed up because that can be a big driver of malnutrition in the long term. And this talk has mainly touched on diet, but just a quick point that resistance training is a really big part of getting people to build appropriate bones. So we'll often get people to work with our exercise physiologist or their trainer if they've got someone who can put them through an appropriate program. And finally, follow-up bone density measurements and body composition scanning is um, something that's quite easy to do because a DEXA scan is a cheap and very low radiation dose scan. So it lends itself well to regular follow-up, which helps you individualize your approach. So to wrap up, good bone health is simply put good overall health. Bones are more than just calcium and protein is critical if we want to build new bone. We need to focus on several important micronutrients. And I just want to note that building bone later in life is possible for patients who've been told they cannot. And at the end of the day, there is no compelling reason that a protein forward, low carb or a ketogenic diet is necessarily gonna be detrimental to your bone health. <laughs>
So thank you all for your attention. And just a quick note about our clinic and information if you wanna go um, find some more information about how our clinic works. Thank you. Thank you.